Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Good Time Show. I'm your host, Damon Epps. Today, we are embarking on an Ozark adventure with Danny Collins, founder of 37 North, an ultimate adventure company. Discover your inner adventurer at any level and unveil the hidden treasures of the great outdoors in this incredible region right here in Northwest Arkansas. All right, Danny. So tell me about 37 North and what it's about. You want the short version or long version? Uh, give me the short version because we're going to dive into it anyway. So yeah. you so might we'll as well give it short and we can just keep going along. Yeah, I mean, our mission, it goes back a long time. And like I said, we'll hit that. But really, the, the very simply put, we're we're trying to make it simple and convenient to get outside more often. We we think what we have in our backyard here is just un, just unbelievable, outstanding, and people take it for granted. And we love to show it off to both residents and visitors alike. Um, speaking of that, people that don't know where we are in the world, we are in Bentonville, Arkansas, which is at the, how would you say where we are in the world of the Ozarks? Pretty much dead center of the Ozarks. I mean, you know, essentially the, the really the Ozarks, I think a lot of people don't really know what that means, but when it comes to kind of, you know what, Danny, I don't even know if I know what that means. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just, I mean, I know it's the mountains and they I don't know even it's... know what the range goes to. exactly. Yeah. I don't have right. any idea. But I know that this um, is all of a lot of Missouri, a lot of the Northern part of the, of Arkansas, even into Oklahoma, a little into dips into Kansas. But the idea really is that, I mean, what we have here and not many people know about it. It's really, there's nothing like it all the way to the Appalachians and all the way to the Smokies, really. I, I mean, all the way to Smokies, all the way to the Rockies, right? So, you know, if you're, we that's why we're starting to get people to come from good portions of Texas, Oklahoma, all the way up to Chicago, all the way, all the way east, right? I mean, because really, it's it's what we have here is is really rivals those places, and there's really nothing in for hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of miles in any direction. You had something really cool to say the other day when we were in passing that. You guys are really the only company that is really expanding beyond the biking world. Am I making that up? No, I think that's fair. I mean, our mission, and again, I'm sure we'll get into the deep dive of why that's passionate for me and everybody kind of that's that's attached to us. But the idea is that we want to do it all so that because our big goal is to be that point of introduction. So we, I am personally am a firm believer that you've got to be able to the, to to protect these places and, and want to protect these places and want to get deeper, you're going to have to go see it firsthand. And so my goal is whether it's birding, it's hiking, it's paddle boarding, it's kayaking or it's climbing or, or biking, you know, or anything in between is you find that thing that you love and you're passionate about. And that just makes you want to spend more time in the great outdoors. So really that, that kind of to have that, some people might say it's crazy to, bite off this goal of doing it all when it comes to outdoor recreation. Um, but we, we really do just about everything. You pretty much anything you could think of in this outdoor recreation. We have a, we have a policy is a no bullets, no gas. <laughs> and it's not uh that's what is that again? No bullets and no gas, but anything else in outdoors is, oh, is, no bullets, is no what gas. we try to. Yeah. So it's kind of this idea. It's hard where, to get away from bullets out here in Arkansas. Though. It is, but it's done no, well. So it's I'm not just... like, yeah, it's not a, it's not, it's not that we are against that in any capacity. It's literally that that's done well, that doesn't need us as much. And so we kind of focus on those other things. You are from Northwest Arkansas, or are you from Bentonville? Where where are you from? How did we start our little life here? Yeah. Uh, how did yeah. the Danny Collins get into the world? All right, now we're going to go back, back. But, yeah, we're going to uh, go way back, and then we're going to bring it all back in. Cool. Yeah, no, I mean, I I actually grew up in a little tiny town called Pure City, Missouri. So pretty much just a stone's throw across the border. Uh, my big town that I would have gone to from there would have been Joplin, Missouri, Back then, nobody would have come to Bentonville or this region really at all for for things. People kind of surpassed that, right? Went past it. Um, little tiny town, 900 people. Um, I ended up going to college in Springfield, Missouri. I went to play soccer, but I got my master's in architecture, my MBA there as well. Um, and then I hightailed it, and this is a big part of the story. I kind of hightailed it out as much as possible. I, I just had that desire that there's something the world's bigger for me and this is not going to fulfill any this region would never fulfill my aspirations uh, moved to new york city lived there for about four years what brought you to new york city a uh, corporate architecture actually so i took a very very corporate job for a very uh, not very corporate but very large scale um uh, uh commercial architectural firm 
did a lot of projects uh, in Asia for a bit and then landed a really big job there in New York. Um, and so did that for four years. But on the side is where I started to, I guess, the, the Ozarks, the Midwestern in me needed to get out of the city. Um, don't get me wrong. I loved my time in the city. Mm-hmm. I really did. It was a yeah, New York's a great time. town, but it, yeah. is, it eats you alive after it a does. while. It does. And I found a cool little outlet that was... Um, I started just kind of joining with this company and going on some outdoor explorations to upstate New York or for anybody from that region or knows that region. It's yeah, that's also it's yeah, that's a weird, that's a funny thing is like when you when you talk about Jersey and you talk about New York, um, obviously it was a small you know I, I did Jersey Shore and you know I did mm-hmm. um, a bunch of shows in New York City, and but I've, I even recently I did a show where it took me out to kind of the outskirts of even Jersey, mm-hmm. and you don't realize like how country yeah, Jersey you even gets. Yeah, notions of that region, and it's anything but outdoor connection. Yeah. But it really has some special places, and yeah. you can get out of the city pretty quick. So, long story short, I ended up guiding for this company. Started with day trips, started doing some overnight stuff in the White, sort of the Adirondacks, and then it led to getting the chance to lead trips to like Kilimanjaro and Machu Picchu and some of these bigger treks. Oh, I wow. personally really got into mountaineering. That was kind of what my drive and my competitive outdoor drive led me to want to summit high things. And, and you've then, always been an athlete, I assume, and you yeah, just kind of built it up. And Traditional team sports pretty much were my go-to, except, and I could talk about this too, but my father was a really big paddler. Um, okay. And so I really did grow up on the, the rivers here, and that's kind of, to kind of connect those two things, I just fell in love with that world. Um, One day it hit me. I'll never forget what trip I was on that I didn't make much, but I just made a little bit of money guiding. And it was with this group that just, they were very special. They, they were so happy (laughs) and not saying that my job in New York as an architect was, was bad. I honestly, I would never want to say, I think it was amazing. It was an amazing firm. I had such a special time there. The people but there was something about sharing those experiences with these people I was guiding that just turned me like, wow, I'm, I'm, this is not quite a career yet, but there's something here that I'm really passionate about. And that was kind of the first trickle of like, wow, I want to, I want to make a career change and didn't happen immediately, but I started to kind of have that desire. And one thing to led to another through my connections, through guiding down in, in the Andes, it, it led me to getting a job with National Geographic. Okay, let's get in. Somebody mentioned this to me. Yeah, that you had a part of National Geographic. Okay, I'm I'm excited about this piece because I know nothing about it. It would, and honestly, it's even cooler than it sounds in a lot of ways, and it shaped me even more than you would ever imagine. But I went from living in living in Manhattan, working at Bryant Park, to living and working in the middle of nowhere uh, in South America in Ecuador. About six, four hours down a gravel road uh, outside of Quito, Ecuador. just and that just happened overnight, like it just not not really, really. okay. Because um, you were working for that other company as a guide, all that kind of stuff. Well, really, what I wanted to do is my wife is actually Ecuadorian, okay, and so I wanted to just start to guide more. So did you? Okay, did you meet your wife in New York and then went to Ecuador, I or met her, met her at Drury University in Springfield, Missouri? Oh wow, okay, yeah, super weird that it came all the way back. But we dated while well, when I moved to New York, um, she came out there too and got her master's in Columbia while we were there. And then she returned home to Ecuador. And so my job or my goals were actually were to just find a guiding gig. Like I just wanted to, they have amazing summits there in that region of, of Colombia, Peru, Ecuador. Um, so I was really kind of aspirational just to, to lead summits, right? And one thing led to another. I had the combination of my MBA and being an American, which is most of the tourism is European or American to that region. It just landed while there's, we got something much bigger and it ended up just fitting perfectly. And, you know, to sum up that task, it sounds like, you know, there was definitely the management portion where I was managing the guides. It was the face of the hospitality. It was everything about anything outside of the hotel doors, which you came for three or four days and lived there for three or four days. So there was a lot of, you came for the experiences. I was in charge of that, but really honestly, more than that was really cool. Um, it's such a proactive uh, organization which that shouldn't come to a surprise. National Geographic. They, National Geographic. But they had a reputation for biology, photography, right? And not saying those are bad things, but this new world of adventure tourism is a slightly different desire for younger generations. And so a big job of mine was um, give a facelift to the experiences at that 
um, at that lodge and the lodges in that region to be more attractive to this millennial Gen Z traveler that it, they're not just wanting different, they're wanting very different, authentic, truly authentic types of experiences, right? And so uh, it wasn't always just about the hotel anymore. And that that's, I think, older generations, it was mostly focused on making a really beautiful place to eat and sleep. The experiences kind of came second to that. And now I think people are seeing a lot, and that's what 37 North blossoms in my mind, is that the experiences in a lot of ways are first for a lot of people's mindsets, right? The other things are kind of a byproduct or secondary to that. So I took that job. Um, it was pretty crazy. I was literally living there. Um, I mean, I, I had an apartment in Quito, but I would it was 10 days on, five days off. So I was like literally living there 24-7, 10 days at a time. Um, and just loved everything about that. Um, what brought me back is, and this is a big shape of, of everything, to be honest, is in 2017, my dad was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. Um, he was young. He was only 56. And so oh, that's so. Yeah, I have a tiny little family. And so it's kind of like my then girlfriend, now wife and I were just, this is the right thing to do. We need to be back and we need to help my mom. We need to, I need to personally be there for those, those years with him or whatever time he has left. Mm-hmm. I needed to felt like I needed to be there. And so we moved back and to be really honest, you know, this is, I think a lot, this is also where that passion comes to showcase what we have here is because I think we both were like, we're just going to put a time out on life and do what we need to do to be with family. And then as soon as that kind of passes in some capacity, we will, you know, take time out or, or finish that time out and, and, and move on to the next thing, whether it's return to that job or, or, um, or something else. But we never thought we would like permanently relocate to the Midwest again. Yeah. I mean, this place, uh, because what, what year was it that you had, that you decided, how long were you in Ecuador? Only about a a little over a year, to be honest. Okay. It was sad. I was in New York. But her parents were there. You, you would, you would, you were kind of all in being a full on Ecuadorian. Oh my God. It fulfilled. So, I mean, it's, (laughs) it's everything that I, I, I stand by. I mean, like the paddling and the summit and the mountaineering and the, I mean, it it fulfilled a lot of desires um, for my outdoor itch for sure. Yeah, we was we was pretty happy. We were both pretty happy there. And then in and then what year did you move back to uh, Bentonville or Northwest Arkansas? Yeah, 2017 is when my dad was formally uh, when my dad was formally diagnosed, and so it was a really bad prognosis. Um, and so it was pretty much that week that I moved back. I didn't really think I knew it then, but I, I never really returned to work there um and slowly but surely you know it was kind of this really weird i think every every entrepreneur has a has an interesting story of the timing right the timing's never right but it was mine is relatively unique at least to me because it didn't come from a desire of i need to own my own thing i'm grew up on a team sports i really i thrive in a community like where i i bounce ideas off people and Mm -hmm. And so it really came from the simple one, two simple facts. One was I just didn't want to go back to what the industry I was in. I left that for a reason. I was right. really passionate about changing my life completely over. And it was just like, wow, I have to go back. It's hard to, to the do. World. I'm kind of doing that a little bit right now with myself. It and- was the greatest, but the hardest thing I've ever decided to do was to leave that relatively safe zone. Safe, but also it wasn't even just safe. It was a really I mean, I think everybody in my graduating class would have killed to have that job. So it was, and I'm aware of that. Um, So some people might call me picky, but it was just, I could tell there was something there and I'm very happy I made that choice pretty early in life. So I didn't want to just go back to that. So there wasn't an industry like that six years ago here. There there really was. I know that. Yeah. I'm like, I got to make this. 2017, six years ago, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, It's crazy. crazy. Um, crazy life just that covid thing put a pause on all of our yeah. our uh time but in 2017 i i say this all the time and i probably said it on every single one of these podcasts i don't know if i would have moved here three years ago there yep. was nothing here i mean they they kind of were building this town you know um but there wasn't that much here yep. now there's quite a bit here but it's not like crazy amounts but there's just enough here to where you can really enjoy your life there's enough mm-hmm. here where you can there's enough restaurants and all that kind of stuff 2017 this place still was not a great place. You well, Bentonville was a cool. It. You, you could, could see, see it coming if you were looking. Yep. Um, but you're right. No, it really wasn't. And it was kind of one of those that I was 27 living in my parents' basement to be a primary caregiver with my dad. I knew my mom, she needed to keep working. Um, 
and I, I allowed myself and decided that this made sense for me to kind of live in the basement, help out with my dad. And, and then that's kind of the inklings of, but really the other two things that happened that were the inspiration for the company that formally made me decide to try this out, me and my wife together. Um, one was, I think I, I went to the outdoors for mental health for the first time in my life. Like I said, remember I'm the summit chaser. Like I really was the the guy that if I, the only time I'd enter the outdoors is to, you know, do something crazy on a in a in a kayak or to do some sort of long distance travel or some sort of high summit, right? And when that was happening with my father, I really I don't think I knew it. It's not like I was intentionally doing it, but I went outside on a way more leisure base just to get away. And we started to just like literally create this incredible map of like, let's go see this new place, this new place. We never wanted to go back to the same hike or the same section of river or anything like that. So it became way more small increments and also, um, but I didn't know what I was doing, but that hit me. That, that was special. And then through that process, I think I was just like, holy crap, we have an amazing backyard here. And the realization to me, my dad was a pretty big paddler right like i, I really, yeah well really i want to talk about your dad just for a minute like yeah. like has your, was your dad like you say he was a he was a professional paddler i mean it's like no, no not no. professional it was just it was his life i mean he would he was a he was a water chaser he was a rain chaser as they might call him around here hitting all the big creeks uh literally the day that he found out he had a brain tumor was he was at a big whitewater paddling gathering i mean it was not per, not paid for it at all but it was a it was Pretty much his life. I mean, it was just everything he cared about. And a paddler, what is it? You know, I'm, I'm trying to be cool, but yeah. um, what, is it, I mean, what, it, what does a paddler mean? He was pretty much anything on any river. Okay. river. So any any live water. And Got it, it. He didn't love the dead. He didn't like the dead. White water, water rafting. Yeah. You know, well, ca- kayaking. Mostly, mostly white water kayaking. He also, of course, the canoes and just a little more leisure based. But he was a he was a white water kayaker, you know, full skirt, that kind of chasing those kind of. Well, here around here, you got to get to hit it when it rains, right? Um, and so if I got that, I guess the realization to me was like, if I lived with a family like that, that he was bringing me out at crazy young ages to go see these places and I took it for granted, well, then that realization is like, wow, everybody's taking, must be taken for granted some capacity and how special right. this place is. So Cause I don't even know if I've seen hardly anything. Sure haven't. I, I haven't seen I anything. Let's be very clear. I've, I'm still fascinated with like buying a mountain bike, going on these trails just right behind crystal bridges, and then yep. you come across a river or like a tiny little stream and the deers, and yep. that's just in the middle of the city. Yep. Um, yeah, exactly. I mean, I'd say that really was one of those two things, the mental health concept, and then also this kind of like, wow, everybody's taking it for granted, was the, wow, there's something here uh, that we need to, we need to assist even our residents, let alone our tourists, but let alone our residents, to see what we have a little bit outside of just the main kind of skirts of town was kind of the foundations of it. I mean, the amount of people that have lived so many of their years of their life here and have never been to Ponca, Arkansas is that hurts me. That literally like it, it eats me from the inside out. I just can't believe it. Like how special of a place we have. That's an hour and an hour less than almost an hour and a half from here. Okay. Hold um, on. Hold on. Because yeah, you have, I don't I know. know it at <laughs> all. What is this place you speak of? At the Buffalo National River. It, okay, it's, okay. It's the Ponca, Arkansas, in my mind, would be the epicenter of the Ozarks. You know, Ponca and Jasper, right there in the core, iconic sections of the Buffalo River are, it's our, it's the country's first national river. It's just over an hour from here. I mean, and it's a v- incredible, the highest waterfall between the Appalachians and the Smokies, the some of the best, one of the longest free flowing rivers in the country, the first national river. And it's right here. And a lot of people don't even know about it, which is just crazy to me. But, but anyways, all these things, I'm just telling you like that, like that all just started to kind of become a driving force for a very competitive inspired individual like myself. And that was kind of the foundations of 37 North. And we, you know, we started in 2018, but I mean, we, you started. we started yeah. with like one trip every Saturday. I was it's crazy, but to think going back then, like I literally would run to Enterprise at seven in the morning, get a fifteen passenger van, and go pick people up from a parking lot that we just found that would allow us to park there and let people park there, and then I, it was just so uh, bootstrapped, right? I mean, it even still is. I mean, we're but really those first two years were just a big trial and error. Like, what 
is a Midwesterner going to let me drive them to the middle of the woods? Is <laughs> Are people wanting kayaking? Are they wanting hiking? Are they wanting 12 months a year? And we started just ask the questions and we figured out, yeah, all, to all, everything, right? And so that was kind of, I, I say we became a company uh, really, really into 2021 because we kind of figured things out and then the pandemic came and it kind of crushed a crushed lot of everything. stuff. And it crushed us initially, but then people refound their connections to the outdoors, right. and that helped us in a way. In that post world, that's true cared too. About that. Yeah, I, I will say that. I, I, I mean, I'll, even when I lived in Hollywood, one reason why I liked living where it because I think I would have died. I think as soon as I could never live in New York. I think that I have to have a connection with nature, mm -hmm. even if it's I'm not deep. You know what I mean? Not deep yeah. nature. But I lived at the base of the Hollywood Hill, so. I at least could walk out of my door and within four minutes I was at the base of the Hollywood Hills and it's a beautiful, like, I mean, all of a yep. sudden you feel like you're in, you know, Vermont or something, just hiking a trails. Yeah. It doesn't have to be. And again, I think that's something we're finding even more like some of our partnerships I can talk about, uh, you know, some on our, especially on our corporate side or our youth side, it's about like, it's right here in our backyard. It's not that it has to be, you need your outdoors it's actually funny if I go on a little tangent here, something I, it's weird to say, but the term outdoor recreation, I don't want to say I have problems with it, but I have problems with it. It's like here, especially, I want it to be more of an outdoor lifestyle. And I think that's what we have here. The mm -hmm. difference between outdoor recreation, especially that terminology tends to say evenings or even probably more likely weekends. And so therefore it's saying outdoors is a time of your day or time of your week even more. Versus it's just part of your lifestyle. Here, I ride my kid, my two-year-old, by single track to daycare, you know, or... So funny. It doesn't have to be... And that's that's a that's kind of like an example. I understand everybody doesn't get to do that. I'm, I'm aware that that's a privilege of mine. But what I'm saying, it's... It can just be go to your city park. It can be... We do a program with one of our um, healthcare corporate partners. It's take back your lunch break mentality. Like, it's... Don't just suck into looking at your phone or even just answering emails as your your 12 to 1 mentality. It's like go outside. Uh, it doesn't have to be about getting sweaty. It can just be spending time outside. And and so I, I guess that's for me, it's more of like a lifestyle desire. And that's that is just as important, if not more important than going and seeing these iconic places. So we started with this idea of like bringing to these more I iconic places, but really the bulk of what we do now, um, we can talk about that a little bit, the evolution of the company. Yeah, as we can say, that's youth, kind of where we're at. So. Yeah, and our youth and our corporate especially are hyper-focused on um, really the stuff that can happen right here in town, you know, two-hour paddles or hikes or bike rides after work or at lunch or – you know, it's not really just about this, like, let's go take an entire day or weekend to go mm -hmm. do this iconic thing. There's definitely different layers of um, of your relationship with the outdoors. So, yeah, I, I mean, to kind of segue myself there, it's, uh, you know, we started, and a lot of people, if you've heard of 37 North out there, you probably hear about one segment of our company. With it, well, I really say we have three. Uh, a lot of people don't know how big the other two are, but that segment is kind of, my creative architectural brain and my wife who used to be super involved, she's not really all that involved for so many reasons now, but uh, healthy, good reasons that she's not as much. But that started with this creativity of like, let's come up with something super fun. We have this, what we call our, our uh, 37 North formula. It's get sweaty, get connected, equals get happy. And this idea is like we generally, every one of these single ticket sales side of things are like, an outdoor activity with some sort of social endeavor, and that's kind of a, a full day's worth, right? So horseback ride and then a winery tour or a oh. sunrise yoga hike with a outdoor brunch or a, you know, a, some sort of like paddle with, and then we go do a brewery tour or, or just have some sort of social endeavor. It's also about seeing a new place. But those are like, they're very seasonal, um, they're very, they're very, they, we have to do things for the holidays. We do a lot of unique, fun things. It's like, this is your thing to do spontaneously. It's, you can come alone, which is also really important to us. That, that segment of the company is less about quote unquote, the profit margins or the anything like that. That's like okay. incredibly dynamic. That's 
fulfilling, to community have options, building. community building, and maybe even more importantly, if you don't have that crew to go do these things and you yearn to do it, whether it's speak for confidence or just desire to be mm-hmm. social, that this can be your outlet. So that's kind of what you might probably see on like our Facebook and our social media because that's very dynamic. Um, the other two segments though, of our company are, are really a lot larger in numbers and probably even impact um, and for sure revenue. Uh, that's youth and corporate. Um, our youth is very exciting to us. We, I, I, I think. How long has the youth thing been around or the youth in the. We had it very integrated to the rest of our company for quite some time, but it was kind of more what you could say pulled out, at least in certain the summer camps and the after school programs. Those aspects have been pulled out for about two years now. Um, and, you know, I mean, as I sit right here, I think we have 95 kids in summer camps right now today. Oh, wow. Right. So we're doing. And where do the summer camps go? Like where, where, yeah. 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 I mean, and that's actually a pretty cool thing is that a lot of our summer camps are actually with existing group sets. And by that, I mean, we do a lot of work with the boys and girls clubs. We do a lot of work with some private schools from Faden, if you might have here and some others in Springfield region. We do um, actually have an unbelievably cool partnership with the Springfield public school system in Missouri. Um, the biggest the biggest uh, public school system in the state of Missouri, actually. And so we run a lot of their summer programming. Um, So it's a lot of these group sets that are already existing, and we go in and facilitate outdoor programs within that versus some of our stuff, and that there's nothing, there's no right or wrong between the two. We do a little bit of both, like creating our own group sets. So like our after-school programs are a lot of like our own what we call internal programs versus like doing them from our outsets. And those are... um, you know, a little bit of everything. Honestly, again, it's the idea is we don't need to go do these epic things every day. It's teaching survival skills mm-hmm. in a really fun and dynamic way. Or we teach birding and we talk about, you know, early concepts of statistics or early understandings of Latin or, oh wow, you know, we put those in front of... Into, Sounds like I need to go to summer camp. Right. It's it's a lot of fun. It's a, I think that nobody would probably argue with the fact that we're in a little bit of a crazy, maybe concerning type of situation for our kids right now with technology taking yeah, over. I was, that, I was literally just about to say that of, mm-hmm. um, that, you know, I didn't grow, I grew up in the middle of Dallas, so I'm a Texan. Um, but I st- like the, every, growing up, we all had our bikes, you know, no parent, we had no phones. You know, we would say, Hey mom, I'm leaving. When you coming home, be back before whatever. And you would just come down and come back where the sun was down. But you were active. Like, you did yeah. things. Like, you didn't have 400 network television shows. You had eight or whatever it was. Yeah. Once Gilligan's Island was over, you kind of uh, packed up and went somewhere else. Yeah. I don't remember ever, uh, I mean, really, like, legit. I know this sounds so cliche, and but I don't remember ever coming inside until my mom forced me to come exactly. inside. Right? And exactly. Exactly. So- and I, by the way, and I wasn't like the, I wasn't you, I wasn't the yeah. outdoor guy, yeah. but you didn't come home. You yeah. just went around and mm-hmm. there wasn't enough to do at home. And I don't so, think that's, and I don't think that's completely lost at all. I'm not trying to sit here and sound like oh, no. I'm an 80 year old man that we need, oh, no, especially no, no. in this little amazing bubble that you and I completely no. live in. But well, I got problems being on my phone too much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no I mean, doubt. No like, doubt. Right? I got problems. But I think there's a couple other things to maybe get a little bit higher. These are kind of our focuses for our youth programming is again, we're a, about we have a little bit of a uh, as a group we have a focus on tradition the the world of outdoor programming for youth right now is a little bit in our mind too focused all the time on just you've got to learn this you've got to learn this and learn this it's and that's about the success rate of a camp or an after school program and i get it as a parent i get it you want to know what Mm -hmm. am i paying for mentality it's like I learned to fish or I learned to shoot a bow and arrow or I learned how to hold a kayak paddle. And while those are important skill sets, it really – the goal is to just be more comfortable in the outdoors. Mm-hmm. Like at the end of the day, if our win is if that kid wants to go back to the outdoors. So again, kind of like with our adults in a much similar version, it's like we want to expose them to a little bit of everything so they hopefully find that one or two things that they're like, wow, this is for me. And then they start – latching onto that and do it on a little bit more on their own i think that's kind of one the other thing that especially coming from i mean i played collegiate soccer it was literally it defined me um it was the most important thing in my life i haven't played soccer in 
gosh knows how long, Mm -hmm. right? But I think the idea for me is very passionate is traditional team sports are so uber competitive now that like kids are exiting earlier. And so we want that outdoors to be that it's not either I'm a team sport or I'm nothing really active. This outdoor recreation, this outdoor lifestyle concept, we have a strong passion that that can fill that gap as well. Or even just seasonally. Now it's like, you know, when I remember I, I played soccer so competitively that outside that season, I wasn't doing that. And so, so I guess the team sports, I also just stated I think the Boy Scout Girl Scout mentality is not what it used to be. So there's right. a lot of there's a lot of kind of gaps that we're trying to fill um, in in the communities we serve with our youth programming. So that we're really excited about that kind of we take a really strong wellness. We do a lot of reflections. We journal every day with the kids because we want them to just feel cool and comfortable being present in the outdoors that's the ultimate goal and that's kind of a hard thing to sell there really because you're not selling to those kids who are, who are seeing the benefits you're selling to the parents so it's actually all um, the, the secret's going to be out of the bag since your podcast is going to come out here but we actually slightly change how we talk about it with the parents because the parents want to know the tangible things and i get it oh that's I really funny but well, they're paying, so they. But whatever. the goal is, and I think that goal, the goal, and they understand it at the end. If we get them, it's just that kid to come home with that smile on their face, and ask to go do that thing outdoors. Like that is the. If we could choose any win in the world, it was something they did. Like, hey, mom, can we go out and go on a hike and go go walk around on the greenway and look for birds? I learned to go how to find a cardinal. I learned what a cardinal mm-hmm. sounds like. I mean, there's nothing better. I, I think it, no matter what kind of parent you are, that would be like a super great feeling, right? Yeah, I, well, I, you know, it, it wasn't the grand outdoors. It's actually, I was just thinking, um, I guess really I got in touch with the outdoors because my grandmother who moved from East Texas into Dallas, um, so we were all city kids. You know, we didn't have anything later, later on in life. She remarried a very, very country, <laughs> beyond country uh, man who never had kids, wasn't even good with kids. But I never had a grandfather like that, so I just latched onto him. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was, you know, he was catfishing and, you know, selling junk on the side of the road. And I couldn't get enough of him. But I would, I was always around the outdoors, and I'd never really, you know, I had to, I had a machete for the first time, and I would just go around and. I, I found out later I should not cut all my um, grandmother's peaches down like a ninja <laughs> warrior. Um, but just that little piece of my life changed kind of who I am of like, I would have never fished. I would have never ran a trot line in my life. And now yeah. I feel like everybody in the world's ran a trot line. And then I talk about it and people don't even know what even a trot line is yeah, or how I it mean, does, people but it changed come, my life. Yeah. There's people that come from the farming background to the outdoor connection. There's people that come from the true outdoor adventure. There's people that come from a specific sport that their parents win. And it doesn't really matter what it is. It's again, the culmination of that to us is you just feel comfortable in the outdoors. Mm-hmm. It's not intimidating to you or it's not as intimidating as it could be. That to me is like, that's that barrier. It's, it's don't feel intimidated by just spending time in the outdoors um, and do you have a favorite story? Present. Do you have a favorite story with like the kids, or is there a is there a moment, or is it all of it? Or I mean, the kids, yes, but I, the story I, I I told you that the thing that made me change to desire want to change my career was it was I uh, I took this group out from New York City. We were doing just a relative, relatively simple hike. It was in the late fall, starting to get cold. We did a hike, and um, I just decided to start a fire, and we do some s'mores there at the very end because we had some time. And these two women from the Bronx, and it was so special because I could tell this was this was their big spend, right? They saved up for this. I mean, I could tell this was a huge thing for these two to come out, two best friends, and never, ever experienced something like this. They were just infatuated the whole time, but incredibly infatuated with that a human can start fire. And it sounds so elementary. It's so funny because it's such a New York I, I use thing. a lighter. I mean, I, it's not like I like took flint <laughs> or you know rub sticks together. I just, but I, I literally used a lighter. But they were just like, wow. But I you mean, put the sticks together and like shape the thing. Yeah, I whatever. wasn't even thinking about it at all. It was just this, and they just asked all the questions, and it was just one of these like I am just so infatuated with sharing your 
this great experience you're having. And I want, and that's also when I think of 37 North, a lot of people think we check the box of a guide service. Well, technically I think I have to for tax purposes and stuff, but we, we are a hospitality company. I mean, we, we curate exceptional experiences. It is most of the stuff we're doing. We're not even trying to say it's stuff that you can do with, you can't do without us. It's, it has nothing to do with that ego, that concept of we got everything for you. It's really, we're just trying to elevate that experience so that you have that great time. You have a different outdoor experience or anyway. So that, that's one that really always sticks to my mind. That was just a very powerful, I mean, I can picture those two, never met him again, never anything, but I can picture those two so clearly, um, just had never been out of the city. Um, but anyways, I mean, that's a, so that's kind of the, that's the youth. And very similarly, it sounds crazy to, to say, but very similarly is the passion on the, on the, on the corporate side of things. Um, you think corporate, um, our corporate relationships, and some of them range from, we uh, take a lot of small teams out on just a day, right? And that might, you might think of that as kind of like a, an alternative happy hour. And our passion is, in there is like, man, if you're choosing to do that over just going and opening up a tab at a bar, and again, I don't think there's anything completely wrong with that. I'm not trying to state mm-hmm. don't do that. I'm just saying every once in a while there might be some people that that doesn't fit for right. that want something a little bit more engaging or fits their profile. Um, two amazing relationships with Walmart and Cox Health and some of these larger corporations, those relationships are just fantastic because those are like, we're talking about mental health. Um, mm-hmm. We're talking about retention and attraction um, shortcomings for for these large organizations. We're talking about beta testing burnout. Like, could this could something like in a relationship with with outdoor programming actually help with not only retention but like a true mm-hmm. mental health burnout for their employees? And so that, and then you know, some of a lot of those relationships that we take further are we'll do team building exercises that are like teach you how to read a map and a compass and go in a small adult scavenger hunt that's boats and or kayaks and foot and and then come back and let's have a serious reflect. I mean, we did one very recently with a really large organization and we came back after they went on this hour and a half, very fun, small team scavenger hunt. There was like nine teams of four, right? They went out, they've try to find these checkpoints that we had hidden, right? And by map that we presented to them. And we came back and we asked questions like, okay, hey, did you use everybody? Was there somebody that was literally just dead weight? Did you find ways to like work together as a team? Did you learn something about an employee or a coworker that you never knew in a personality trait? Did you, you know, if you could do it again, what would you do to effectively be more pro, pro efficient in what you did? And so it's not just fun. It's also not even just mental health. We're meeting those organizations at the level of like, this is not just something you should do for your employees because it's because they care about it. It's also something you're going to see actual tangible ROI on. Right. And that's we're not quite there to present everything we want to. But Mm -hmm. that's the data we're going after is that you do this and it's proven that you have this level of a retention or this level of a. um, Wow. And even having conversations with like insurance groups of like, okay, hey, this program translates to less claims. So can oh, they crazy. get it paid for? Right. And so we're, I mean, we're trying to take that corp when we say corporate, will we take you on a fun out day on the river and, you know, have a super fun social day? Absolutely. Cause that's a win too. But we're also right. t- talking about it in the form of this is not, and I think the, the mountain bike trails around here have proven that this is not just a this in today's world in today's society. I mean, an electric are, bike and everything has changed my life. We are just not talking about things from the perspective of of it's fun, and that's outdoor life. So we're talking about it from this is dramatic. These are economic functions, right? Building these trails have an economic benefit to mm-hmm. our the community you and I live in, and. Those are the things that we're also translating on the corporate side of things that we want to meet them and not just say this is something funny. This is something that you have to do right in today's society. I think taking people to the outdoors instead of a happy hour, not only does it because people do, they go to the happy hours, but they're kind of forced to go to the happy hours. It's like, hey, just show up. Yeah. But you know, you kind of have to show up. 
but you don't really have the same, you know, especially like people that don't really like going to bars. Now you're kind of just stuck there for an hour. And of course, then you're stuck with your work friends. You're not in a place that gives you any kind of ammunition Nope. to talk about anything new that really opens the door as a person that really likes to connect with people. And, you know, sometimes it takes an out of the box an out of the box experience to really open the door to someone's past or really diving deep yep. because the things that make you really connect with somebody is finding out personal stuff about someone, yeah. you know, like when yeah, I learned I mean, about it's... your father and all that kind of stuff, it re mm -hmm. you become more of a friend. Yep. And then that becomes, like you said, Especially in a post-COVID world where we're not having as much face-to-face -face time and we're not having those quote-unquote water cooler interactions as much anymore. It's you need to bond with your, your co-workers to be and and I I maybe somebody can actually argue with this, but it's this is at least my gut intuition is that you gotta have those engaging relationships to actually be incredibly productive yeah. together. But it's even I'll take it a step further than that. It's not even just the fact of like focusing on um it's really not just this idea of like forcing bigger, different experiences for people to open up. It's actually in a way trying to translate these are, it doesn't have to be grand. It doesn't have to, a outdoor experience can literally be the same amount of time and in a way probably the same amount of money to an employer as opening up a bar tap, right? And so it's not, we're, we're actually bringing, we do a lot of like two hour team building activities, right? And so it's like, we're really trying to say, it doesn't have to be a more grandeur. It doesn't have to be that the concept of, if one more HR person comes to me and says, well, I got Iron Man Ted and I have Donald who probably hasn't rode a bike in maybe ever. That's, it's, the outdoors doesn't have to be intimidating. Most of the stuff we do again is like, we have lots of amazing outings for, we did one a month ago for 250 people. We went to a riverside spot, a private riverside spot and had a home base with live music and food. And everybody got to choose if they wanted to go do a thing. And we had 15 spots for kayaking, 15 spots for stand up paddleboarding, 15 spots for mountain biking. So they went and did this little fun activity and then they came together. And one of those 15 spots were walk and look for birds. And another one was sit right here and put your feet in the water and now chairs. you have shared experiences yeah and so it's it's we we really are not trying to keep we're trying to create that counterintuitive concept to the outdoors are incredibly intimidating and so that and that that again is that that's that outdoor lifestyle that i'm, I'm that's the word over outdoor recreation that i super gravitate towards personally at least you have some personal stuff that's coming up you are heading to Ecuador again for a big race. Is that correct? Give yeah, me, give me what you're doing. Hours. Forty-eight hours. So, go ahead and fill me in because you are not just an avid. Um, I mean, just a slacky when it comes to <laughs> yeah. um, being an athlete. Tell me what you got going on, and then I want to kind of go back and find out what you got going on in the future of this. Yeah. This company. Well, um, so I my sport. It's funny. I played collegiate soccer. I. Got into the marathon thing right after that. I got into the Ironman thing when I had a knee injury and I needed to swim and I couldn't run for a while. And um, But really, as wouldn't come surprised over the conversation we just had, I mean, my passion is like in the woods, right? Being in the woods. And so there's a sport called adventure racing. It's relatively unknown to the larger population of the world. But, you know, uh, Eco Challenge and the world's toughest race with Bear Grylls, some of these TV shows that you might be mm -hmm. super familiar with have yep. actually kind of brought brought a little bit more light to this. Sport. I know Bear Grylls. I don't know what he's racing, but yeah. I'm going to be honest. <laughs> but anyways, it had, it's, it's essentially adventure racing is map and compass all off trail. Mental, well, not off trail, but just all navigation by uh, by map and compass. And so wow. there's that six hour scary. races all the way up to what I'm doing here in, in three days is a, is a five day race. And so, five days. and it's, it's all literally you're presented with a set of maps and it's pretty much go get these checkpoints out in the world. Um, and Hold so on, before you go any further, there's no restaurants, right? <laughs> where like, you could try to find one. You could try and to you're find allowed to go in. Okay. You're allowed to find, you're so allowed to go in. If you want how to, far but, is this race? I don't know if you were just about to tell me that. Like how? Yeah. I mean, I'll bring it back. So, so I have been doing that sport for quite some, I finally found that and I just fell in love. And so I've been doing everything from six hour. I mean, to, to nationals every year is a 30 hour race, been doing these things. Crazy. And I got the chance. Those are like outdoor foundation, um, here in town. 
we presented to them and kind of collaboratively decided, man, the Ozarks would be a perfect place for what they call an expedition level race. So back in April of this, this year, Expedition Ozark was born. That was the first year of that race. It was super special to be part of the Venture Racing World Series. Um, myself and Jason Bettis were, were the co-race directors. Um, talk about kind of going back to want to showcase what we have here to the, literally the world. Um, that was a pretty cool way to do it. We had 10 international, 10 plus international teams uh, from 10 different countries. Wow. Uh, a unbelievable 400 mile course that just mm-hmm. saw everything and you don't touch a you know, you'd vehicle in between, right? So anyways, that's that race that I was the race director for. Um, that's what we do. Right? I go and race those races across the world. And so we have one here in Ecuador. It literally starts on Sunday. And then um, this year we'll finish with a world championships are in South Africa in, in October. Um, and so it's such a cool way. They're both five. Well, this one's a four-day race. And then, and then Africa is actually an eight-day race. World champs is an eight-day race. And yeah, it, you got to completely self-supportive. So you got to carry all your own stuff, your own food, your own, you got to obviously filter your own water all the time. Um, so it's a very different Did preparation. There's no killing anything. Okay. Right. No. I, right. Well, I think it would just take too much time. Right. <laughs> so okay. it's not yeah. about, it's not about survive. It's about get to the next point. Okay. So got it. Okay. Generally saying we'll run like this race, will hit about 350 miles, um, about 35, 30,000 feet of elevation gain. Oh um, we will we will attempt to only sleep probably about five hours in total is over the, the 90 the 90 hour race. So it'll be it's yeah, it is taking things to a whole new level um, if you're trying to be super competitive. But you also can go to these races and be a little bit more relaxed about it. And it's just such a fun, cool way. And we had a lot of people do that in Expedition Ozark, which was really cool to see. Um but yeah, no, that's that's the sport that I'm just infatuated with. Wow, um, I crazy. love seeing a new place from that perspective. Um, it's such a cool, fun challenge, and also you don't really generally get um, you don't get team sports in endurance. Sport. You don't get team in endurance sports very often. So this is a legit team. There's four of us on a team. You got to stay together the whole time. Some and I tell guys. you what, day day four, day five, when I'm at my lowest of lows, and I'm either hallucinating or wanting to cry because I'm so tired and just losing control over certain things. Somebody on my team will take care of me and, and help me push through that either physically or mentally and then vice versa. And I think that's a really, really cool, powerful thing that I love so much about is that teamwork. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That yeah. Is... So adventure racing is part of the adventure racing world series. It's got a really cool circuit. If I think there's like 30 or 40 different countries that have a race right now. Uh, Expedition Ozark is is uh, amazing. It's only one of three in um, in the United States, which is so cool to be a part of that. Um, and and yeah, we it was cool to hear the you know back to being the race director side of things. Oh my gosh, did I have such fun designing that course? I mean, it's not just about the iconic things. You want to hit those. And you want people to see them, but it's all those special places in between that are again off trail, so off road. Um, that's here, right? I mean, I know it's here, but I mean, yep. but you start where you go. You Expedition Ozark last year was in literally Bentonville and Fayetteville. We 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 home home base was in Fayetteville, and then the end the finish line was in Bentonville, and yep. we went four hundred miles in between, right? So did a huge That's circumvent crazy. all the way down to pretty much. Is it is it biking, river swimming, yep. Yep. It's all of it? Yeah, biking, and again, sometimes the biking means smooth single track. Sometimes it means nice gravel roads and sometimes it means bike on your back right because it's just too gnarly and you're you're the cool thing about this sport is that you are presented with checkpoints you can more or less get to those however you want to right so if you wanted to grab your bike and walk it through the middle of the woods because that would be faster than you than going circumventing all the way around to get to a road or something like that you have a lot of choices and options so navigation is a huge proponent of this um Trekking, there's a lot of sections where you'll just you. There are sections where you leave your bike and you come back to it, or you we bring the or the race team would bring your bike to the next stage for you. Um, like this one, we will have a, a 35 mile straight trek that's really mean in Ecuador. That you get elevation quickly there. Um, in Ecuador, in Expedition Ozark, we actually had one that was 55 mile straight trek, um, and then paddling. 
paddling is is generally speaking it tries to be like more fun whitewater type of pack raft so a lot of times we'll have a pack raft which again is some a boat that inflates Mm -hmm. um and we'll have to carry that for a while right so you have to carry the boats and paddles and pfds and everything so Wow. It's a yeah. It's a well, it's good a luck test. to you on that one. Yeah, you don't go a million miles an hour, right? I mean, it's just not impossible. It's impossible too, but it's it's about efficiency. Keep moving forward and teamwork. that kind of teamwork. Yeah, it's really fun. We dove into a lot of things that you got going on. Is there what's the what what do you see in the future? Is there any kind of big things that you want to do? Or you know, on thirty seven North specifically, um, we really want to take the next level on our relationships with our youth and our corporate programming. Um, in in a way, especially the corporate. I think we've got our youth dialed in a lot. Now it's just kind of like fine tuning things. Like we have, we know where our headspace there is is on this kind of mental health, this kind of wellness connection. The corporate, though, we really, I mean, we are excited about living with Fortune One and with a community that is just a hundred percent focused on on its connection to the outdoors, and that we are that bridge. Right. We want to continue to be that bridge as we grow more and more people coming in and residing here from the coasts and different places. We want to introduce them how to be an outdoor explorer in the Ozarks. And and then we also want to keep finding ways for these different corporate groups, these different organizations to use our backyard as as not only just things for fun, but also to really capitalize on this is why you live here right it's one thing to to it, one the best way to put it is i think that like there's a lot of people that probably say oh yeah you want to live in 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 northwest arkansas and here's why it's because of the outdoors mm-hmm. right that's generally what everybody would speak about maybe specifically the biking yep. trails but it's really if you summon it, it's the outdoors but they're not playing a role in helping introduce them to that and that's where we are that bridge we want to we want to continue to breathe that bridge and take next level um conversations around the insurance and the, the the health and wellness this we we also have this amazing thing coming in that's a you know proactive medicine right the you know the the, 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 the school of medicine and the the wellness centers just those mm-hmm. are going to be incredible additions to our community like we're thinking like that um so that so 37 north i, I love where we live um i love where we reside and kind of we do it all we really focus on paddling like paddling is just so special to us. Um, it's it's funny to say it's like almost secondary to the biking. Um, biking is something we do, but the paddling is like just where our heads at in a lot of ways. Um, but personally, I've you know I've got actually recently asked to sit on the Natural State Initiative, which is like governor appointed type of position. Um, Very cool. Um, so kind of working with some incredible individuals on thinking about the future of not just our little pocket here, but also really in a way the state of Arkansas and how we can, AKA the Ozarks, how we can kind of keep differentiating ourselves. It's cool to live in a, in a state and a community that are like, I don't want to say all eggs in one basket at all. Cause as you've shown on your podcast, there's a lot of other things really cool happening mm-hmm. here, but, but it might be, it's fair to say it's one of the main eggs, right. That they're putting their, their focus on I mean, and that's awesome to be a part of that and personally um i just want to keep finding ways to um i'm just so passionate about that i'm i'm i'm, I'm so incredibly cognizant and aware of what a little bubble this is and what a unique opportunity to get to do what i love doing and talking about it um creating these incredible outdoor experiences and and so, yeah, I just want to keep finding ways for myself personally, both with the company, both without, to just interject myself into get to be together with others that are dreaming up the next 10 years or, or beyond of, of what the state's going to look like. I tell you what, I mean, it's from the little increments that I get to be a part of that and have those conversations with those people. It's freaking exciting, right? It's We are Very cool. We are going to, I am so excited to, to live here 10 years from now and I'm already, I know, love it's, my life right now. Yeah, my know? life is pretty good. I got to tell you, this is, uh, I, you know, I, I don't see myself moving yeah. because this is probably one of the most exciting places to live. Yeah. Um, Dynamic. It's a very strange little, little bitty town. There's nothing like it in the world. We say that on every single show. 
How do we get in touch with you for the rest of the people out there in the world? How do we get in touch with you? How do we, how do you make it happen? Yeah. I mean, I think we have a really great social media or Instagram, Facebook, but website, we really just try to be, you know, we are still in that world where we're very openly stating, Hey, this is, we don't want you to feel intimidated in the outdoors. And so therefore our website has a plethora of information. We try to stack every trip and everything with recommendations or ways. So in other words, there's a whole lot on our website. So I really urge everybody to go to our website. And even if it's just to use it on your own, go steal one of our trips and go do it on your own. We're open about that. Call us and ask where to go on a hike by yourself. Like we, we want to play that outdoor concierge whether either directly or indirectly. Um, so go to the website. You'll That's find 37 North.com 37 North expeditions, 37 North expeditions.com. North expeditions okay. Mm. Great. Yep. And if you, add anything there you'll get you'll get me still okay <laughs> one way I, or the other you'll get okay me. i like it well danny this has been a good time yeah thanks talked I, a lot there's a lot to talk about i there, appreciate it very yeah much. no man that was that was a really good time i don't even know how long we've been in here but if um it was a lot of fun i really appreciate you for coming on the show good luck to you and good luck to you on that race man yeah no i appreciate it thanks thanks for what you do too honestly it helps not only small businesses but just to kind of keep urging everybody to understand hey the, all the cool things going on here so thanks for what you do too all right well good times good times everybody well that's our show if you didn't get a chance to watch the episode check it out on youtube and spotify you can also listen to the good Times show on apple podcast or any other platform we are always trying to grow our planet good times community so subscribe and follow us at good times us on almost all social media platforms this episode was presented and recorded live at Blake Street House Sound Lounge in Bentonville, Arkansas. A social club where people from all walks of life come together just to be themselves and make the community a better place. Till next time, good times, everybody.